Hi, I'm Mark Childs from Charles Davidson. Welcome to our video series on FMCG issues. You know, I, often when I speak at conferences, I'm asked what I think are the big challenges facing our industry. On this video, I'm going to talk to you about what are my top 10. Now, I'm not going to try and deal with issues outside of the commercial functions like sustainability, food safety and so on, although I acknowledge that they are also very big challenges for the industry. I'm going to talk about those things that face the marketing and sales functions in a business. Now we deal with about 110 active clients around the world in four continents. So you can imagine we get a lot of exposure to what's happening in our industry. Before I go to my list of 10, let me first of all just put this in context a little bit. I've been in the industry for almost 40 years now. If I go back to the 80s, what we saw then were manufacturers who were globalizing. Uh, a great deal of innovation, lots more SKUs entering the system and therefore stores getting bigger. It's sobering to remember that in the early 80s we didn't have internet, we didn't have, inter in we didn't have international direct dialing, we didn't have Skype, we didn't even have mobile phones and in fact in those days I was in an international job where we communicated with countries using telex, would you believe? Hard to grasp that that was so recent. In the 90s we saw customers consolidating and becoming more powerful. We saw the advent of category management as an increasingly widely used methodology and from a manufacturer point of view we also saw premiumization. And what that caused, of course, was a big gap in pricing structures that created the conditions for discounters and private label. In the noughties, we saw customers globalizing. Now, the truth is most of them didn't do it very well, and it didn't advance as quickly or as significantly as we thought it would. Um, but we certainly saw them growing in confidence and taking charge of the way they were running their businesses. In the teens, of course, it really is feeling like we're in a new century. Complexity has increased, particularly for the sales functions in FMCG companies, facing challenges like never before. So I'm, I'm now going to come to my list of 10. I'm kind of artificially breaking it up into five that relate to consumers and shoppers and five that relate to customers, but I'm sure you'll appreciate that they're all pretty much interconnected. So to my first five big issues that I think relate mostly to the way shoppers and consumers are changing. First of all, shoppers and consumers are becoming smarter, better informed, spoiled for choice, um, prob probably influenced a little by the fact that in many categories the number two and three players and even private label have caught up. Uh, such is the fact that over the last five or six years innovation has kind of tanked in many categories. And the fact is that most of the products on offer in categories are pretty good. Um, as a consequence, or perhaps related to that, consumers and shoppers have become more cynical harder to influence, harder to convince about, about brand differentiation. I see research in recent times that says that shoppers are making up to 85% of their choice at the fixture. Now I'm a little skeptical about whether you can make an average like that and certainly when I talk to clients across different categories those percentages are dramatically different. But still, I think we all agree that increasingly shoppers are standing at the fixture and making a final choice amongst a, a wider repertoire that they would have had than they would have had before. Also, referring to their smartphones, of course, and making their pricing comparisons. The next challenge, I think, and it relates to that, is the growth of private label all around the world. We know, for example, that no longer is private label you know, the black and white packaged, poorest quality, cheap product. I'm not saying there aren't some of those still around, but many retailers have become very good at this. Uh, Tesco, of course, uh, 
paved the way with its good, better, best strategy. And they have some really good products in their range. Um, clearly, we're seeing private label in more and more categories and they're gaining share. In recent times, they've slowed somewhat, probably because of quite intense price competition from national brands, but it's clear that they're here to stay. Uh, in countries like, say, the UK, they already represent upwards of 50% of total category. We also notice that in some recent research in Europe, the price gap between private label and national brands has narrowed slightly. And if there's one thing I know, it's that pricing is a measure of differentiation. So what does that tell us about how consumers see the difference between private label these days and uh, national brands? My number three is discount fatigue amongst shoppers. Probably over the last six years or so after the global financial crisis, we've seen manufacturers and retailers struggling to retain volumes, fighting for share, and prices coming down and discounting increasing. So the volume sold on deal has been on the increase steadily. We know from the uh, trade spend benchmarking we do in about 20 markets internationally that the cost of doing business is on the rise each year. We see that on average, the amount of trade spend as a percentage of uh, gross sales increases by about one percentage point. What that says is that each year as we cycle again, it's harder to get the same volume we got last year for the same discount program. The next one I want to talk about, number four, is omnichannel. Now that's probably been uh, sponsored more by retailers than by manufacturers, and their view of it is necessarily different. For retailers, omnichannel is about store formats and about having their products available every, on every occasion when a shopper wants to buy. For manufacturers, my view is that they should view omnichannel much more as being at every touch point along the path to purchase when a consumer or shopper is making a decision about where to shop and what to buy. In any case, for both manufacturer and retailer, these are new challenges that require new learning and new resources to be able to come to terms with them. And we, so, we know that uh, heads of marketing around the world in our industry say that this issue is one that will make or break them and that they're not good at it. My fifth challenge is about big data. Now, I don't really like the term big data, to be honest, and, and I suspect that we'll grow out of that in due course. Fundamentally, though, what it's telling us is in a world where every consumer feels that they should be able to exercise choice, then every consumer is a segment. So I should remind you that in our industry, we tend to chunk the, the marketplace into large segments, but we do that really for our own convenience to make it possible to be able to market to those segments. Well, those segments are gonna get smaller and smaller and more specialized and more specific. And of course, omni-channel and new channels to market are going to make it increasingly possible to do that. For example, there are products that uh, probably would not have the uh, turnover to justify them being on shelf in a supermarket. But if you were to aggregate them nationally, you would probably find that there's a sufficient group of consumers who might buy them online and that that would be a viable segment. Again, this is a whole new area that manufacturers will need to learn more about and develop new ways to reach smaller segments in the marketplace. Now to my next five major challenges, and I've said they've kind of artificially divided into uh, what the consequences are for customers. But of course, we realize that a lot of what's happening with customers, if not everything, relates back to what's happening with consumers and shoppers. The first of them, my number six, is the emergence of small neighborhood stores. 
Now, I'm sure you'll recall that the demise of the neighbourhood store, the mum and pop store, in many developed markets was a consequence of differences in price parity. What's happening is hypermarkets are now losing share to the small neighbourhood stores, but these are much better organised than ever before, uh, very often owned by the majors anyway, and also the, uh, the advent of discounters, which are of course are smaller neighbourhood stores. Um, so we're seeing smaller basket sizes and price parity very often, and that's what's attracted the shoppers back to uh, the neighbourhood store. Number seven is the major retailers are taking charge. And I mentioned that as a feature of the, of the noughties and also this decade. Um, they have lots more data than ever before, including for many of them, much better use of loyalty card data. Most of them now drive their own promotional calendar and are not all that receptive to manufacturers coming with ideas about promotional activity. They're also taking much more control of range, including range rationalisation, and I'll come to that as a separate point. There's also, I notice, a significant decoupling of pricing. Whereas once manufacturers would put through a price increase, the, man, the retailer would then implement it. We're now seeing in very uh, many uh, markets, manufacturers having a lot of trouble getting price increases through, but retailers taking their own price increases on shelf on their own initiative. And the fourth uh, that I want to comment on in relation to this is that for manufacturers, particularly medium and small manufacturers, the cost of influence is going up. And I often say to manufacturers they need to seriously question how much return they're getting for the amount of resource they put into staying in the game and maintaining active influential dialogue with customers. For some, it's simply not viable anymore and staying under the radar might well be a better option. Now, I already alluded to the rise of discounters. Of course, we know that Schwartz Group uh, is at number six globally and Aldi is at number nine and at their current uh, average rate of growth they're certainly going to move up in the rankings in the near future. But of course, there are many other discounters in the marketplace. The fact is that they are setting a floor to prices because they're more able to uh, reflect low prices because of their low cost model. Aldi, for example, has set itself up to be able to operate stores with you know, two people. Um, so the reality is that consumers are increasingly realizing the discounters are a whole separate, better value chain from a, an economical product range point of view for staple products than the traditional mainstream retailers supported by branded manufacturers. My ninth challenge, and this is one I alluded to earlier, is range rationalization and the fact that center of store is shrinking. Now, it's very clear that retailers would really rather sell everything on the perimeter of their store because it's fresh, deli, bakery, butcher, fish market, all of those things attract footfall to their stores. They're the things that the retailers know really differentiate them. The truth is that centre of store with all those rows and rows of packaged goods are pretty boring. There's not a lot going on in that. Uh, part of the store. And little wonder then that retailers are expanding their ranges elsewhere and squeezing that part of the store. My tenth challenge is online and of course no talk about the challenges of our industry would be complete without at least mentioning it. We know that in some very advanced markets its market share has already reached double digits in the UK for example in Western Europe and in uh, North America, approaching double digits. And most commentators agree that it will continue to grow rapidly in the years ahead. The only point I want to make here is that most manufacturers are really only participating on the edge of this development. All of them have websites, of course. Almost none of them have 
tried to come to terms with selling online, many of those websites don't even deal with where to buy. And certainly many of them look as though they were designed for brand information only and have not really worked out how to interact with the marketplace through their websites. So that's my 10 major challenges. I want to leave you with a couple of final thoughts. My view is that there are three big areas that FMCG manufacturers should certainly get their heads around. One is investing in brands and driving innovation more aggressively and also refining ranges ahead of customers deciding to rationalize your ranges. Secondly, reassessing customer engagement strategy, creating new norms for how to engage effectively and also questioning the cost of engagement and the cost of influence. And thirdly, organizing to engage with consumers and shoppers along their path to purchase. This is Mark Childs. Thank you for joining me.